In this online lecture, we're going to talk about the last mechanism move that we can make here, and that is number seven, rearrangement. And here are our key points for this lecture. We're going to see that one rearrangement is due to a hydride shift. Another rearrangement can occur from a methyl shift. And the other type here is called a methylene shift, or sometimes called a ring expansion. And the key point here is that this carbocation rearrangement will happen if in doing so either one a more stable carbocation is generated or two a more stable ring is generated and therefore has less ring strain. Now let's look at each one of these shifts first. Let's look at the hydride shift. First of all what we see here is a secondary carbocation. Notice that carbon has two carbons directly bonded to him, one on the left and one on the right. And remember we learned in a previous online lecture that he's roughly in the middle of the road when it comes to stability. But what we're learning here is that this can happen. Here's our mechanism move. Notice this arrow is showing this particular movement. And the result of this movement happens to be this structure right here. And notice after this movement, we have a new carbocation. He has rearranged, hence the term. But notice here that the carbocation is a tertiary carbocation. Notice he does have three carbons directly bonded to him. And remember we learned in a previous online lecture about carbocation stability, and that is tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary. Which means the move that I'm showing you here, there is an incentive for this to happen. And here's the thing, it will happen. But let's make sure we can visualize this move. Here's a close up of what we just saw here. Remember we started out originally with the secondary carbocation and this was our arrow movement like this. Remember the arrow shows movement of electrons. So the electrons are moving over in this bond and the hydrogen is going along with them like this. And what's happening here is we're getting a new carbocation because the carbon that we shifted the hydrogen from now only has three bonds and no lone pairs. Therefore, he's going to have a positive formal charge. And notice the carbon that we shifted the hydrogen to now has four bonds, no lone pairs. So he has a zero formal charge. And not only that, remember in doing this move, we also generate a tertiary carbocation. So what we're learning in organic chemistry is that we're allowed to do this. Now, when would we do such a thing? That's for later on. We'll talk about that in another online lecture. All we're learning now is what we're simply allowed to do when it comes to a carbocation. And what we've just learned is we're now allowed to do a hydride shift. But let me show you the other move we're allowed to make. We can also do something called a methyl shift. Again, let's look at this move. Here we're starting with a secondary carbocation. And in this case, we're going to shift an entire methyl. And the arrow movement would look like this right here. The result of that arrow movement is this structure right here. And notice in this case, again, we're going from a secondary carbocation to a tertiary carbocation. So there's an incentive for this to happen. And again, just like what happened in the hydride shift, the two electrons in that bond are moving over to the carbon to the right and taking the methyl along with it. We're going to be doing this for reactions later on as well. Now here's another shift that's slightly harder to see. Let's say for instance we start with this molecule right here. What we're going to see here is something called a methylene shift or sometimes called a ring expansion. But before we do the move, notice the carbocation that we have we have a tertiary carbocation. And what we're going to shift here is this carbon right here with the two hydrogens. A carbon with two hydrogens is called a methylene and that's why we're calling this a methylene shift. The arrow movement for this particular shift looks like this. And let's look at the aftermath here. After that move you would have this structure. Notice the methylene is now connected to a different carbon. But also notice what happens here. The new carbocation that we're getting here happens to be a secondary carbocation, which might make you think there should be then therefore no incentive for this to happen because again remember secondary carbocations are not as stable as tertiary. 
But in this example, something is overriding that rule. And let's do this. Let's get a close-up picture of this move. Let's look at the slow-mo here. The first thing I want you to notice is before the shift happens, you're starting with a four-membered ring right here. And then during the shift, we're saying this is the move right here. And let's see that in slow motion. What's happening, remember, is the electrons and the CH2 are moving over to the right like this. That move then leaves this carbon with one less bond, therefore making him the new carbocation. But notice the size of your ring now. It now has one, two, three, four, five carbons in this ring. So even though this carbocation is a lower stability secondary carbocation, the fact that we went from a four-membered ring to a five-membered ring means that we gain stability in a ring expansion. In a previous online lecture, we talked about how most of the time smaller rings have more angle strain. And for this particular case, definitely a four-membered ring has more angle strain than a five-membered ring. So what's happening here is due to this shift, we are gaining a more stable intermediate. So we're not technically breaking any rules here. Remember, the overall trend of carbocation rearrangements is that a rearrangement will happen if it leads to a more stable intermediate. And it just so happens in this particular case, a five-membered ring with a secondary carbocation is more stable than a four-membered ring with a tertiary carbocation. Now, let's just finish this off here. Remember, if you're on an orgo test and you have a ring expansion, then you have to make sure you can clean this picture up here. Meaning this, for instance, your molecule again is a five-membered ring that has two methyls connected to one carbon in the ring. And next door to that carbon is the carbocation. So cleaning him up, you would now have a structure that looks like this. Again, a five-membered ring with two methyls connected to one of the carbons, and the carbon next door has a carbocation. We're going to be doing this in reactions very soon. So that's our methylene shift right here. Now, I want to show you another example that seems at first to go against our trend here. Look at this molecule right here. Notice we're starting out with a tertiary carbocation. And what I want to show you here is that in this case, a hydride shift will happen. And that means this hydrogen right here will shift over to that carbocation. The resulting structure is this structure right here. Now, if you evaluate the new carbocation, you would see that he's a secondary carbocation, which might make you think, again, this shouldn't happen. There's no incentive. But careful, he's not just a plain secondary carbocation. If you look closely, you'll see he's also an allylic carbocation. Remember, allylic means that he's one position away from a double bond. And we learned in another online lecture that this particular carbocation has resonance. Remember, we can say the pi electrons in the pi bond over here can move this way like this. And if you remember correctly, resonance has a way of stabilizing molecules. So technically, there is an incentive for this shift to happen because we are gaining resonance stability. So here's another case where you may go from a tertiary to a secondary carbocation. Or in other words, secondary allylic carbocations are more stable than just plain tertiary carbocations. So what we've learned so far is simply what we're allowed to shift. Again, hydrogens, methyls, and methylenes. But here's the thing, knowing this is not enough to help us later on with reactions. What we want to do is to be able to predict whether a hydride, a methyl, or a methylene shift will take place. For instance, let me show you an example here. Later on in organic chemistry, we're going to end up in the middle of a reaction with this particular intermediate. And what we're going to do is take a look at him and notice that he has a secondary carbocation. And what we're going to need to do is to predict if any kind of shift will happen. Well, let's do this. Let's get a close-up view. And what I'm about to show you is what you need to do mentally later on.
The first thing I want you to do is, when you're about to perform a shift, make sure you know you could only shift from neighboring carbons. That means you could only shift from carbons that are direct neighbors to the carbocation, which in this case would be these two carbons in the blue circle here. So that means let's focus on the right carbon first. On the right carbon, he has a total of three hydrogens. So the right carbon could only provide a hydride shift. So that means mentally in your head, what you're gonna do is imagine shifting over one of the hydrogens, and it doesn't matter, any one will do, and see what you would get. Notice after that shift, we would get a new primary carbocation. There's definitely not an incentive for that to happen because again, primary carbocations are less stable than secondary. And in this case, we're not gaining a ring that has less angle strain, nor are we gaining resonance. So we can say for sure that a hydride shift will not happen from the right-hand carbon. So go back to the drawing board here with your secondary carbocation. Then focus on the left carbon. Notice the left carbon has a hydrogen and two methyls. So you can potentially perform a hydride shift or shift one of the methyls and get a methyl shift. Let's try the methyl first. Let's shift this methyl over. In doing so, we would end up with this result right here. Our new carbocation would be here and he would be a secondary carbocation. Again, notice there's no incentive for this to happen. We're not gaining any extra stability. A secondary carbocation is turning into another secondary carbocation. So we're gonna know not to do a methyl shift in this case. And again, we're back to the drawing board here. Now we can shift the other methyl, but that would yield the same result because again, we're shifting the same thing. So to see if we get something different, now let's do a hydride shift from the left carbon. In doing so, it would look like this. And as a result, we would end up with this intermediate right here. Notice here we land on a tertiary carbocation. So that means we have predicted the actual shift here. There would be a hydride shift and it would come from the left-hand carbon. So going back to our setup here, that means we would know to perform this hydride shift from the left carbon and therefore get this as another intermediate. This is how we predict what kind of shift we're gonna get. Pretty soon this is gonna be very quick and intuitive for you to do as long as you practice a lot. And please make sure you do because we're gonna see later on doing this rearrangement right here is just one step of a bigger problem. And now's the time to get good at this, so when this does happen, we can quickly go right through it. So, there it is. What have we learned here? We've learned we can do a hydride shift, a methyl shift, and a methylene shift. And the key point is, is that carbocation rearrangement will happen if in doing so, number one, a more stable carbocation is generated, or a more stable ring is generated, and that is a ring with less ring strain.